Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Business of Cyber. On today's show, we've got Ty Sabano. Now, Ty is the Chief Security and Trust Officer at SciSense, which is one of the leading data analytics and business intelligence providers. Um, they're a late stage uh, tech company and have raised a couple hundred million dollars from some well known and highly respected VC firms uh, like Battery Ventures and Bessemer. Um, now, on the conversation with Ty, um, a couple of really interesting components that were intriguing to me in the prep and ultimately have made this episode stand out as um, fairly unique is um, really primarily that Ty is a new CISO. Uh, this is his first time in a CISO role, and he's got an incredible background with uh, experience at you know, companies we all know, like Lending Club and Target, Capital One, et cetera. Um, but in that sort of first experience as a CISO, um, he's been dealt some kind of tricky situations. Um, first, and going back to around this time last year, were the California wildfires. Um, this, for you know, a company with a heavy presence in the Bay Area, was obviously hugely impactful to the day-to-day -day lives of a lot of the employees within SciSense. Um, so we talk a lot about how this sort of hugely impactful physical experience uh, really changed sort of the lives of a lot of their employees and how did that impact sort of life for Ty as a newer security exec? Um, not to mention, right, even beyond the wildfires in California were the global COVID pandemic that, of course, changed everyone's life last year and to a degree still today. Um, so within that, Ty shares some really interesting reflections about how he sort of led through adversity, um, what it's taught him for, as both a leader um, and then more specifically as a security leader. So ultimately, really enjoyed the discussion. Um, hope you all do as well. And before we jump in, just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to my friend, Al Ghost, who made the introduction to Ty. Now, without any further ado, handing it over to Ty Sabano, the Chief Security and Trust Officer at SciSense. Well, the party is off to a good start. Ty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Joe. Awesome. So as a way of kicking off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background? Yeah, so a little bit about me, uh, mostly around fintech running application and product security teams. So the early parts of my career, I did a little consulting, uh, but ultimately found that transition through consulting that fintech was really investing in security at that time. So I've been in the space for about 15 years now. And you know, I think banks continue to lead the front when it comes to investments, experimentation, and just trying to protect people from their money getting stolen. I think identity and data has become a hotter and hotter topic, which is how I found myself in my current role. Uh, as I went and built all these app and product security programs at various companies, I kind of knew I wanted to get up in the startup space. And I found the perfect inflection point with a data analytics organization called Periscope Data. Uh, Series B, uh, I was the head of security, so I did everything from regular security to physical security with people's feelings of not feeling safe on the streets of San Francisco, and who knew that would take up so much time, uh, all the way till some of our legal work, uh, building out our first patents program as part of Periscope, uh, just protecting IP and that concept behind it. So it led me down a lot of very unique things that I was able to just add a bunch of value through the course of that action, uh, we were acquired. So I was part of the acquisition efforts by SciSense to consume Periscope data. And we've joined this late stage organization and I've been doing this role for about two years now and it's been quite unique. So year one, uh, acquisition work, bringing together two cultures, uh, trying to figure out you know, how do we merge products? How do we build out a security culture in the larger entity? But also how do I make sure I have that opportunity too? So that was part of the journey as well. So I had to navigate not only some of the early acquisition conversations, 
all the way until I needed to complete a lot of our compliance activities to maintain certificates for Periscope data like SOC 2 Type 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA, uh, with one of my main partners in compliance, Ramon Hayes, who really helped lead us through. And also a year later, we even expanded and grew it. But through that effort, I had to negotiate at the same time to say, hey, I want to put more time into this acquisition. However, you don't want me and the team to slip up and not have our certificates correct. So we worked through that. I spent about 30 days doing a gap assessment. I presented and pitched to the organization and the founders, Amir Arad and others. And that way, um, I created the opportunity and the offer on the table as well to step into the role of cloud CISO and then ultimately global CISO. Uh, and it's been part of my life goals to become a CISO of a medium to large firm. And I was really happy and excited that I was able to achieve that goal and my first time being a CISO because I had only cool. done application and product security prior to this. Cool. So first time being a CISO, what's it been like? Whew. Um, it's, it's unique. I think I'm uniquely built for the, the role in the organization. I, I come from more of an engineering background and an engineering culture by empowering application security programs or product security programs. I've been narrow and deep, not only with technical leadership, but individual engineers and talking about how do you fix cross-site scripting? Uh, what is input validation? Why should we care? Um, how should a logging practice actually work or API management or key management and things like that. So I think it's been really beneficial from that standpoint that I've been able to integrate consistently with engineering teams. On the flip side to that, AppSec is very unique. We touch a lot of topics and I think metrics has always been the heaviest for me, so that's been easy. Uh, but one of the other unique aspects is training and awareness. You know, you're always training your engineers, but also now we're having to train the basics of basically InfoSec 101, you know, like how do you make sure you join the company, you understand confidentiality, you understand lease privilege, you understand phishing attacks that are constantly happening, even though we have controls in place, doesn't mean that it can stop every one of them. And it's really down to that eighth factor in the OSI, the Open Systems Interconnectivity Model of the human. How do you empower the human to be successful in the org? So I think taking a lot of the lessons learned of expanding from engineer to more larger persona groups has been a distinct advantage. So I've, I've been pretty happy with the outcomes, the results. I'm three years into this role, uh, you know, average tenure. I'm sure you've, you've gotten to know it by meeting a lot of other CISOs. It's 17, 18 months for a lot of us. Uh, so I feel pretty good uh, on, on the journey so far. Now the future, who knows? Like it's it's a bright future. Sure. No, that's that's awesome. And, you know, you mentioned the, the human element being sort of, you know, the, the critical piece. Um, we'd love to dig into that a little bit more. Sure. Um, how have you maybe seen that develop as a critical piece of, of your security strategy? And are there maybe specific things you've done or, or learned along the way to, um, uh, to sort of expand that? Yeah, I think the, the, the piece I mentioned about physical security was kind of unique and, and being in California and San Francisco, I, I don't know if I was prepared, but again, I was maybe I was distinctly and uniquely prepared for things I do outside of my role. So I've been in martial arts for like half of my life, if not more like 27 years, more than half my life, um, 20 some odd years doing martial arts, thinking about operational security, growing up in a military family. There's a lot of things that you learn of how to interact with people, how to interact within crowds and present yourself and make sure you're safe. Um, as I came to learn by working in this role, not everyone is continually thinking about operational security or even how they walk down the street. Um, so physical safety and security, it really comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People need to feel safe to be successful. If they're constantly stressed at work, they're not going to be successful. So we've built a lot of that human element into our business continuity plan. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain that because I think it leads into pandemic really well. Yeah. Um, my team and I, Ramon Hayes, I'll mention him again, uh, we kind of built out a plan for the fires uh, within California, working with our people operations manager, Mel Tantinko, at the time where, I don't know if, if you remember reading about it, but California's forests were on fire. Yeah. And it looked like Blade Runner 2049 uh, one year, the year after, like the air quality was so bad that you couldn't walk around without an N95 mask on. Otherwise, you were going to get sick pretty quickly. Yeah. People inside of their homes needed air filters. So we actually started a lot of that sort of crisis management, if you will, and business continuity then. 
And I learned a lot of lessons from that moment that translated into the pandemic response. So shelter in place versus shelter at home, sheltering at home. How do you send humans home? Well, if we don't have masks, if we don't have water, like how are we going to make this a good experience? And for us, we plan for these things. So when pandemic started hitting, we actually had that built into our plan. Now, not to this extent by any means, but we actually thought about what that experience was. We translated that to all of our office locations to say, cool, um, how much water, how much sanitizer, how many masks and, and the mask thing just kept coming up. Yeah. So even acquiring masks for all the humans, just in case they came into the office and we had to declare, you must go home or you're sick, go home. We started moving that into that larger plan. And I'm really thankful that we dealt with the fires because it led to that next logical step. And that led to the next one, which is people need to work from home. Well, once people started working from home, the mass situation was no longer really relevant. But now let's translate people feeling safe. You're no longer in the office. You need certain aspects of your environment set up. Uh, it took me about six months to invest in mine. I was sitting on like a little tiny desk until I invested in a desk, got a mic stand, got all this other stuff set up because yeah. I wanted the optimal work environment. But when we started the process, not everyone was thinking about it. Not everyone was prepared. So even building in the capability of like a work stipend that has turned into a monthly payment uh, when initially it was like, all right, everyone's getting 250. And imagine having that conversation with the CFO saying, Hey, we have 800 people. I need 250 or 300 bucks. I actually asked yeah. for like 500 for everyone first. And he's like, no, that's crazy. Um, to just start the process to say, okay, need keyboards, need a monitor. Monitor is a big thing, but just how do you effectively do your job? Because mm -hmm. if you don't feel empowered, you're not going to get as much done. So we started to address that. And that transitioned into cool let's let's just make this a stipend let's just make this not even a stipend but how do we do it for tax purposes to make it cleaner so they don't have to hit expenses every time because when we did the 250 bucks it hit all of our finance team yeah you know so so we we made adjustments along the way and i think again the key lesson learned is by empowering your employees to feel safe by giving them the resources that they need they can do their job and be successful and that's something that a year later, I feel like we have validated we've had to make some pivots and some adjustments, but we're, we're on the tail end of a lot of this to the point where it's a distinct advantage for us now because we're yeah. so prepared because we've had the adjustments. And, and I think that's paid dividends in the long run of even integrating with leadership, too, because I don't know if I would have worked this closely with all the players that I did during that time. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and you know, we, we hear a lot about security teams trying to tie themselves to business outcomes. And it seems like this is an example of that sort of business outcome where it's assuming more responsibility as a company and sort of changing the, the dynamic of the role of the company to be very much focused on how can we make lives better for employees and for yep. those who are you know, dedicating their, their energy to the company itself. So that's, that's interesting. I, um, I don't know if there's a magical answer, but, you know, as, as a CISO, like I, I look to my peers <clears throat> and, and a bunch of them that, that have been on your show have been very helpful in guiding me in my process. Uh, but, a, but a big part of it is like sometimes as a CISO, you need to lean into areas that are not information security that are more human capital based. Yeah. And again, if you're not investing in your human capital, like that's your most critical asset. Some people may say data, some people will say your source code, but it's your people that make your company. So yeah. you do need to do your best in protecting and defending them. A question about that. I, I've had some guests on the show and, and just some other conversations with, with CISOs who have been advocates for um, you know, what they call dropping the I from the title and making it chief security officer. And yeah. to, to what you just said, it's of course, information and data and keeping systems online is, is core to business operations, but there's also a, a, you know, a large component that's non-technical. Yep. Um, how do you think about that? Um, chief security officer, like my title is chief security and trust officer, because mm -hmm. prior to my time, there was no real security representation on customer calls as a data company that that's something we had to transform. So I actually didn't want the CISO title. I didn't want the CSO title. Um, those kind of conflicted with me because I thought this was unique. Um, we're selling to other businesses. It's a B2B company for data analytics, BI, business intelligence. And some of our original product is on-prem and you self-host versus a lot of our new future of where we're going is managed service SaaS based, 
which means we have data, we have access to your data, we have credentials that allow us to get access to databases, we have controls and configurations. So the trust has to be higher because it's a shared responsibility model of how we set up these environments. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I think it really just depends on kind of what is the history, what's the experience of the organization, and then what is your title and what are you gonna do? Like when you have a good sense of what are you going to do or how are you going to evolve with it, I think you can come up with that. But I, I don't know if the title matters all that much um, because I've seen VP of security, like behind the scenes, I'm a VP, does it matter? And yeah. Not really, should I just be lead? Should I be this thing? But I, I, I honestly, I don't know if naming matters. It's kind of like similar in my book of like where I report to. I'm not certain if it matters all that much, as long as I can get stuff done. And to me, I look at it the same way, routing back to our previous topic, as long as I'm helping the org stay more secure uh, by influencing, by presenting information, by being data driven, uh, I think we are doing the right things to help empower our org for the future with the right business outcomes. Cool. And do you see any variability in that, maybe depending on the type of business? Like when you went through your background, one thing that stood out is, you know, being at SciSense now, like you said, late stage tech company, probably a very different organization than some of the other companies that you sort of grew up in, right? Like you mentioned Target and other large financial institutions. Do you think that has any variability to it? Um, for sure. Uh, my, my expectation around process efficiency and focus on human capital, I, I think it comes from a lot of that. And also my time at Capital One, I was doing M&A, like mergers and acquisitions, which inspired me to want to be in a startup. Mm -hmm. um, I think the idea of wearing multiple hats versus being in a silo and then having to have cross-functional access to teams, um, it becomes a little bit more unique in the startup realm where there's not anything too big to fail or like a process too heavy to change. It's literally, there is no process. There's a method of getting stuff done, but what is the process? And, and that's something I constantly push to my team as when we were a series B to now, who's accountable? What's our racy chart? Responsible, accountable, consulted, informed. How are we building out the maturity of this model? How are we cross-functionally working with teams to empower it so we're not creating two separate processes that work against each other? Um, because I think what I've, I've found in the startup realm, there's a lot of people dependency as opposed to process dependency. And I think as you build and scale, you have to get away from, hey, let's reach out to Ty for the sales call, or hey, let's go to you know, Joe for this specific security incident. It's like, stop, email security at Slack security team, go into this specific channel, go to this intake, hit, you know, respond to phishing in G Suite directly. Like there's a yeah. lot more process and cultural changes that I think allow for a rapid response as opposed to, I'm always going to Joe, I'm always gonna have the same mentality and intellect, but if he's out on vacation, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna call him. I'm going to slack him. I'm going to text him. I'm going to get a hold of him. And well, then you you don't get the balance. And I think that's something I've observed that's a, much, much different is yeah. that you get to become part of the critical chain of the org and the DNA as opposed to your process. And if you keep focusing and refactoring on those intents from larger organizations, there will be better business outcomes because you're trying to get to that point. And it won't be perfect in the beginning and it shouldn't be, but starting with minimal viable product of what a process should be and yeah. iterating with teams will get you there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I, I see that as well, right. In my, my day job of, you know, you, there's uh, sort of core groups of people maybe who have been at the company for a long period of time, or just know how things flow, who are, uh, who you're reliant on for certain elements. Um, I'm curious just to sort of unpack that a little bit more. How do you go about sort of changing that as a culture or, or changing the behavior to put those processes in place? Like what are the steps you would take? It's not easy. Uh, so make sure you have thick skin, just like, you know, getting into security and choosing this field. Like it's not meant for simple. Like if you want to show up and just get a paycheck, like you're not going to get involved with building process, but I, I'm on the opposite end. I like building. I, I don't like making the widgets over and over and just having the pipeline of the process. To me, that's once you know how to do it, once you can maybe even outsource it or maybe even push it to the right resource in the org, I, I don't find that to be that enjoyable. So as a human being, as an individual, I really like building. Um, so how do you go about doing that within a startup? It's 
be ready. Be ready with the idea that you're going to take on these tasks and you're going to see it through. Um, don't just take something on to just like be a part of it in the meeting, but not actually contribute. And I think my time at Lending Club prior, which was one of the smallest uh, publicly traded companies I'd worked for, it kind of had this trajectory planned and mapped out, uh, took a little bit of a curve. But at the same time, I got to the point where I was scaling up so I could scale down and be more of an individual contributor. So I think be prepared to work. I think some CISOs jump into startups or heads of securities jump in and then then you say, well, I need more budget to do anything. It's like, here's the reality. You, you don't always get the budget and you just have to do the work. So I have a lot of examples where as much as I would have liked resources, budget, all these things, I was the first security hire for this series B and I needed to build this thing from the ground up, but also prove my worth, show my value, get my hands dirty on my keyboard by creating you know, web app firewall rules, get involved with secure design reviews and not just say, hey, I'm gonna outsource this to all these companies. That's, that's a different type of CISO I think than most startups need, which is direct guidance and involvement depending yeah. on the business model. Yeah, but that, that understanding of the business is really critical in understanding what is your role within the business too. Yeah. So can you maybe elaborate that a bit in terms of, you know, you mentioned you needed to show your value and understand the business. How, how did you make that connection? Uh, I think it starts in the interview process. Uh, you know, I, I think if you wait until you get there or a year in until you realize how do I work with the business, Go to start, refactor on your plan on how to integrate within organizations, because I think it's going to be a tough road to integrate. I think it really starts in the interview cycle before you jump on and before you join a journey, make sure you're joining for the right reason. Make sure you're joining because it's the thing that's going to keep you passionate and excited about because it will change. Like if you join a startup and they haven't even figured out product market fit and they're like seed or series A, what happens when they pivot and all of a sudden it goes from business to consumer to business to business? Are you ready for that change or vice versa? Because I think business to business is much different than business to consumer. And if you're not ready for those adjustments, you know, that's part of, you know, the idea that you probably shouldn't join a startup because the agility of your mind, ability to change, ability to pivot with the organization, that's something you have to recognize in an early stage company versus late stage or publicly traded. You're dropping in for a specific topic, a well-defined role. Potentially, it's like we need to lead through a transformation or, hey, we just lost our leader as part of this security operations team. You're coming in to address that, keep the people engaged. Here's what you're going to do. Here's what you're not going to do. And yeah. I think as you factor that out in the discussions with leadership and the executive or the founders ask them too like what what don't you expect me to do you know like yeah. i think we always say what is my day-to-day -day look like that that doesn't exist for a lot of this but what what do you expect my outcomes to be and what do you expect me not to be involved with because i think if you start with some of those conversations um sometimes you'll discover that not everyone knows what security should be doing like I, I jumped into a role as a part of Periscope data without a job description. How many people are willing to do that? Yeah. Because we, we talked through it and eventually for like ISO 27001, I had to write my own job description to showcase it as part of a control because we had to express what is the role of a CISO at SciSense at Periscope data, yeah. et cetera. Got it. Yeah, it goes back to I mean, sort of the, honestly, even one of the fundamental drivers for, for the show is that everyone knows security is important, but when you get into it, right, business people don't really know what that means or how it should be really designed or, or structured. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think more and more people are understanding it. And I think last year with, with pandemic times, it was distinct advantage for business continuity efforts, crisis management efforts of really proving value and worth. Even the idea of like, what are you doing for your cybersecurity tabletops? Like if you're doing them, uh, yeah. but that that's our job as CISOs. Yeah. Educating and making sure that people have the information at their fingertips. Not everyone in the org. It's, you know, need to know obviously and confidential for some topics, but your executive team should have a good insight into what you're there to do and why you're there to do it and why you're the right person to continue to do it or not. Yeah. Well, Ty, we don't have a ton of time left, so we're going to step into the uh, rapid fire round. Let's do it. wrap up. Yeah, that's how we wrap up every interview. Um, basic premise is I ask a couple of quick questions and you share whatever comes top of mind. Sound good? Cool. Let's do it. 
Cool. All right. So first question, what book are you currently reading? What am I currently reading? I just wrapped up a personal book uh, and I'm going to start another personal book here as well. So Ready Player Two is on my docket uh, next time. I'm not reading any business books because I bounce between like personal to work and then I, I skipped one work because I've really wanted to read this one for a while. Yeah, no, that's cool. What, what is it? Tell us about it. Are you familiar with Ready Player One? Yeah, I watched the movie. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, read the book before you you watch the movie, or if you've already watched the movie, you can go back and read the book. I think it does a good job translating. Yeah. But that that's one of those like situational books that I never thought would become a movie because of all the IP rights involved with it. Yeah, uh, Ready Player Two is just the next phase of it. Okay, cool. I'll check it out. Next question: What is the worst piece of security advice you've ever received? Oof, the worst piece of security advice, uh, go slower. Go slower. Okay. Yeah. You know, for, for me, I think working in certain financial institutions, I ran into that, uh, glass ceiling. I ran into some of the, you know, concerned individuals that we were moving too fast. And I will honestly say as an application security professional and practitioner and security practitioner, I think this idea of going slow to not make someone look bad is there's a balance to that because yeah. if there's a, there's a certain bar that's set and it's here and you join a team and you're trying to transform or you were again part of your interview process was to accelerate the journey you have to be very careful with who you're taking advice from and how you're taking it but uh, go slow you're making us look bad i've heard that a few times in my career and i I go back and forth. Sometimes that that is par for the course, but by and large, I've I've not really agreed with that. That's why I'm more in the startup realm because I feel like now I don't have to say it. I've not heard it once. It's mostly thank you for going at the speed that you're going, or maybe we can go faster on some things. Yeah, cool. All right, and last one. If you could turn back the hands of time and get a drink with your 20 year old self, uh, yep. what advice would you give him? Who? That's a good one. Uh, my 20 year old self, my early 20s or my late 20s, because those are two different humans. Let's do early 20s. Yeah, the early 20s right out of school. <sighs> Be ready, because uh, what you joined for was not what is. And I think the security industry has transformed drastically with the opportunities that we are afforded now. There's so many jobs and not enough practitioners to when I left school. I had a midlife crisis when I was, you know, <laughs> 21, leaving yeah. school. I'm like, is this the right degree? Like information science and technology with a focus on security? Like who's paying these people? <laughs> you know, and then I went into consulting and I'm like, well, clearly I'm not getting paid that much. And I really wasn't. Uh, but it was challenging in the onset of, is this the right move? And I, I'm really thankful that it's been worth it to get to this point that, that I'm changing my life, my family's life through a lot of hard work and dedication on a subject matter that it was unclear if it was going to be affording a lot of future opportunities because it was such a small niche skill set. Um, yeah. So I think stay dedicated to the course and keep going. Yeah, love it. Cool, Ty. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you, man. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and joining me on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe.